<laughs> the Paralympic Games, athletes with physical disabilities and visual impairments, happened in 1996 in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was on the Paralympic swim team. And as I was there in Atlanta on this team, I was getting out of the pool and my wife handed me a towel. My wife is very pregnant with our daughter, Ashley. And as she gives me this towel, I notice on closed circuit television, there is a gentleman above the knee amputee, uh, and he's on the long jump runway in the track and field stadium. And this guy, he starts running down the long jump runway, and I'm intrigued because at the University of Arkansas, I'll go pigs. <laughs> I know where I'm at. I know where I'm at. He's running faster and faster, and I'm, I'm a 27-foot long jumper for Arkansas. I'm dialed in on this guy, and he hits the takeoff board. He leaps up into the air, and at the apex, the very height of his flight, his artificial leg flies off. I have never seen this before. He lands here. Artificial leg lands about three feet up in front of him. The entire crowd goes dead silent like Macaulay Culkin, Home Alone. But that long jump official turns, or the, but the long jumper turns back to the official and says, say man, where are you gonna measure my jump from? From right here, my artificial leg landed up there. <laughs> and I said, oh, that's a brilliant attitude to have. But remember, my wife is very pregnant with our daughter, and as, as I'm watching the long jumper, she's watching me. And in this moment, she is seeing a shift, a change, a transformation, kind of a, almost a reckoning with inside of me. Because I told you I was a 27-foot long jumper at the University of Arkansas, go pigs. And as, as, as she's watching me, she understands that I'm no longer in Atlanta, Georgia. I am actually four years down the road in Sydney, Australia, trying to figure out how I'm going to get a running leg, artificial leg, so I can beat this guy who can't keep his on. And, and that's the, the whole thing, right? It's, it's shifted me from this mindset to a mind sight coined by Dr. Siegel at the Mindsight Institute. So I took the invitation. I didn't really understand what that meant. Mike Conley, one of the, the world's greatest jumpers is someplace for the Memphis Grizzlies, was on my team at that time. And he says, uh, you know what that means, John? I said, no. He says, we get to run against the Greg Foster, Ronaldo Nehemiahs of the world. And, and I was like, I got really excited and terrified at the same time. So I went to the hotel, brought back a little 35 millimeter camera. And when, during the warm up, I saw Greg Foster ran over Click. <laughs> Ronaldo Nehemiah, same thing. So it got time for us to get into the blocks, and I, uh, Ronaldo's in lane number one, Greg Foster in lane number two, and I'm in lane number three. And the announcer's voice says, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the field, the men's event 67, the men's 55 meter high hurdles. In lane number one, he just came off a of fresh stint, San Francisco 49ers. He is the only person to run underneath 13 seconds in the 110 meter high hurdles. This is Ronaldo Nehemiah. Crowd goes wild. All right, Lincoln, crowd goes wild. All right, all right. In lane number two, fresh off a of stint at the Murals Games, 55 meter high hurdles. He is the world record holder at this distance. This is Gregory Foster. In lane number three, John Register, University of Arkansas. In lane number four, <laughs> now I'm ticked. Starter calls to that bird dog set position. I'm going to show him who's boss because I just won the 55 meter high hurdles, y'all. Gun goes off. I get the linear expression. I am flying out the blocks, heads down. I approach the first hurdle. I lift my head up, and I swear to you to this day, I got to that first hurdle. And I was watching the best hurdle race. <laughs> of my life. <laughs> so then I was, in the end, I was sitting down kind of in the state of euphoric dissidence, taking my shoes off, changing from flats back to spikes. Woman comes over, sits down next to me. She leans in, she says, I saw you win the 55 meter high hurdles this afternoon. I saw you get your golden seal invitation. I saw you with your 35 millimeter camera down there taking pictures of everybody. And young man, you got exactly what you deserved. So you dishonored your invitation to be here. That man gave you that piece of paper to come here and compete, and you failed to do that. What you need to do, young man, is take those 35 millimeter shots, blow them up, put them on your walls at the University of Arkansas, draw bullseyes around here, them, come back here next year, kick their butts. And then she got up and she walked out of my life forever. 
And I said, who was that woman? <laughs> On the ride home, Mike Connolly said, well, what was Jet Jeanette Bolden talking to you about down there? Jeanette Bolden, four by 100 meter gold medalist in the 1984 Olympic Games, had just taken a few minutes out of her day, out of her time, to come pour into me something I could not yet see in myself. She was opening up my limits because I was focused on where I had been. She was trying to get me to see where I could go. It was an amazing, incredible gift that she gave to me that day. Jeanette Bolden is one of the individuals, you know, I've never met her, and I, I, I got her on the phone one time just to tell her that story. And you know what she says after that? She listened politely and she said, so did I make you cry? <laughs> tough, man, tough. <laughs> Never yield to the expected. Always build towards the greater. Sitius, altius, fortius. So how do you use the success that you had? Just think about this. We won't talk about going too deep in discussion with this. How do you use the success that you had for last year to springboard, to slingshot, to come off the curve with greater, with greater velocity for this year? You have some wins at your sails, but you know we want to make sure that when the wind's in the sails that the, the sails aren't rippling because you're, you're tacked the right way. So I had to learn some of these things too. Just because you become an amputee does not mean you're actually an expert on being an amputee or actually a person that's an expert in the field of disability. In fact, I had some inhibitions that were inside of myself that I really needed to uh, overcome. They were uh, a little bit, how I say it, um, without, with, with being very vulnerable here, I, I sucked in my attitude, right, with people with disabilities. And I didn't even realize it was there. They were those people. Some of my best friends are people with disabilities. That was in my head, right? We say those things about other cultures, about other groups, and we think that we're being um, forthright with our words and that we're accommodating, accepting, or that we have value and benefits. And I wasn't valuing and benefiting my teammates as I was sitting in a gate waiting area in the um, Washington Dulles International Airport. I had just made the Paralympic team. Remember, I was trying to make the Olympic team, and now I'm on this Paralympic team. As I'm sitting there, I'm looking at all my new teammates. They were people who were using wheelchairs, spinal cord injuries, paraplegics, quadriplegics. They were blind, couldn't see. They were had people with cerebral palsy. And then they were there, there were amputees like myself. And as I was sitting there in my stupor saying, what is the value? What's the benefit of being on this team? I want to be on the Olympic team, not the Paralympic team. And as I was watching them and kind of in my own little stupor, I was sitting next to a gentleman in a three-piece, beautiful Armani suit, gator skin shoes on, pulling a Louis Vuitton bag. And he was talking so loud on his cell phone that I just wanted to reach out and touch him. <laughs> my hands myself. I'm in my stupor. What's the value? What's the benefit of being on this team? The gate agent, she gets up to the, little, the lectern with her little self. She says, ladies and gentlemen, flight number 300 is now ready for passenger boarding. Will everyone who needs a little more time and assistance please get up and board the aircraft at this time? So 60 of my teammates and I got up <laughs> and began to walk down the jet bridge. And I said, oh, oh, oh. benefit number one. <laughs> I got on that plane, I was like, well, this is good. Put my stuff away, sat down in seat number 14F. I like the window seat over by the wing and I'm like, oh, I'm good. And I began to see this amazing spectacle of all my new teammates boarding the aircraft, the people that were in wheelchairs were being brought on in aisle chairs. Those that had cerebral palsy and were ambulatory, they were using the backs of the chairs to go to their seats. Those who were blind were being led on by their teammates to their seat. And then I see from the wheelchair basketball team, Tree. Now Tree is a bilateral amputee and Tree stands six feet, eight inches tall. He's walking on the plane, ducking underneath the exercise. He sits down in seat 7C. But I get it. Tree can be a tree at 6'8", or a stump at 4'3", 
depending upon which legs he picks out of his closet in the morning time. So he sits down, seat 7C, <laughs> pops those legs off, hands them to the flight attendant, who then places those legs up in the overhead bin. Back over in 14F, I get it. Benefit number two, more leg room. <laughs> so now I'm, I see the flight attendant, they're exchanging some words over there and the flight attendant says, Tree, may I help you with anything else? And Tree says, no ma'am, I'm good, I'm good. And off she walks back into the first class cabin through the red curtains to get all the ABs on board the aircraft, all the able bodies. So as she does that and the curtains close behind and she's certainly tucked away in the first class cabin, Tree now being 4'3", jumps up into a seat, takes his long basketball arms, hoists himself up to the overhead bin, lays prone next to his legs, closes the bin door. 14F. I catch eyes with Amy, my swim teammate. Amy turns her head, puts it down, twiddles her thumbs, like they have done this a thousand times before. So I'm on the edge of my seat. What's going to happen? And people are going to the back. ABs are going to the front. They're going to the sides. And, and then I'm trying to figure out who's going to sit in that seat. Then we have our winner, Mr. Armani Sue. <laughs> Still pulling that Louis Vuitton behind him. Still talking on a cell phone, and he comes to seat 7B, which he exclaims over his cell phone, and that bag won't fit underneath the seat back pocket in front of him, so he, he, he must go to the overhead bin where our friend Tree has been lying prone for the last five minutes. <laughs> and when he goes to lift that latch, don't get ahead of me now. <laughs> He goes to lift that, boom, out tree pops. Jump just like you did, man. Armani from the seventh row does a Carl Lewis long jump back to the 14th row where I'm at. Papers all over the place. I catch eyes back with Amy. Amy says, oh, that's pretty good, John. <laughs> New world record. <laughs> Armani picks all his stuff up, goes back up to where tree is. No joke. He's in the top of that overhead bin. He now has his hand on his chin. Those little nub legs are crossed. And he says, I'm sorry, sir, this overhead bin space has been filled. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, that was amazing. But then I started thinking about what my reactions were out in the gate waiting area. When I was devaluing my teammates. Because I wanted to be on the Olympic team. Not the Paralympic team. It looked like I was going to be having much more fun on the Paralympic team than I ever would have had on the Olympic team. And that was the third benefit. To know that people choose to live life as they are. It's not for them to adjust to a new shift and a new mindset. It's for us, for me, to do that.